So one of the things that I found when I was getting ready for this series was, um, it's an article written by a couple of uh, IMB workers that live in Central Asia, and it, it tracks what happened to the seven churches. Um, I think this is on our church's Facebook page. Um, if you want to find a copy of it, and if you're not on that, in that black hole, then I'll send a copy to Susie, and you can message her, email her, and she'd be glad to send the link to you. And um, Pergamum, you know, it's interesting when they give in their comments about it because um, one of the things that stood out to them, there were a couple of things that, that stood out when these workers were visiting the ruins of what's now the city of Bergama, um, ancient Pergamum. Um, one is that the center of it was the throne of Zeus, um, which is where scholars think Jesus is talking about where Satan sits. Uh, the other that was kind of surprising was that one of the Turkish town people, towns, town folk um, that they ran into, was very gracious, very hospitable, and said, oh, you're Christians? Oh, we see a lot of you all. You come through here like Muslims go to Mecca because you think this will score you points with God. And it was just kind of sobering to think about that, oh, wow, are they making these pilgrimages to try to score points with God? But also, as we think about it, too, we look at the reality that where these churches were planted and thrived is no longer um, the way, that way. Um, they talk about that they know of a handful of Christians that live in the city, but no organized churches. And so as we're looking at this, it's, it's sobering to think about, but it's also um, just a reminder that God has never given any one particular local church an eternal timeline. We're all on a life cycle. Will rise and will fall um, because no one local church is guaranteed for all of eternity, um, but God's kingdom is. And so wherever a church falls, another one comes to take its place. Well, okay, for those of you that have lived in a cave, what's going on next Sunday? Super Bowl, all right? So we're going to do an informal poll. Who is Team Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, the, the, the Wallers. This is, <laughs> Um, team 49ers? Okay, my sister lives in the Bay Area. Um, team, we're just glad the Patriots aren't in it. And a few. Team, halftime show? No one's tuning in for the halftime show? Team, commercials? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's usually a few um, that, that'll tune in for it. And, and What's interesting about it is this is one of the hottest tickets in, in all of history. And in the Super Bowl in Minneapolis a couple years ago, Abby Cortez was caught by a USA Today reporter in tears. And the reporter was doing what the media does. They're covering the game. And this was outside the stadium. And they happened to see her crying and said, what's going on? Would you mind telling me what happened? And she said, before the game, we spent $2,800 for a pair of tickets. And right after kickoff, the value of those tickets plummeted, but they still needed two more, so they spent another 1,500 tickets to the game for two. So four tickets for, help with math, about $4,300. The problem was is that when they went to the gate to get into the stadium, the tickets were fake. Oh, I know, you just think about that, how much that hurts. and. Oh, they were all fake. And, and here's the thing is that no matter how sad the story was, no matter how much they tried, how much they cried, how much they pled, a fake ticket won't get you into the game, no matter how hard it is. Cortez and dozens of others that were interviewed for this article had all been duped by the ticket scalpers, and they weren't going to be let in no matter what. See, the one who hosts the event determines the validity of a ticket, determines whether or not it is real or fake. And that's why whenever you go, they don't just look at it and tear it and go, welcome, you know, they, they check it, they check the date. That's happened to friends of ours, friends of mine in the past where they thought they were buying tickets from a scalper and then the, the scalper was selling them an old ticket that looked like it, it was an official ticket, but not for that week's game. And so they'll, they'll check it, they'll check the date, they'll check the opponent. Some of them even do a barcode. And we learned this when I went to, with a friend of mine to a Rays game. You go in, they scan, and they do all this. We do this with Disney when we go. When we go to Disney, we don't just have 
a little pass in our pockets that says we have tickets. It looks like this. See, it's, and they can scan it and they can look. Not only that, do we have to scan our wrist and then our fingerprints. And y'all know the biggest challenge there? Remembering which finger we, se we selected. And so it's like, did I do this one? Did I do that? Which one was it? It's the right hand, you know, so we, we came up with a code of how we remember. It's our, put, the, put whatever hand our watch is on, the opposite thumb. That's how we had to remember. And they do all of this to validate so that it is proven who you are. And that's what we're going to look at with the church at Pergamum. A lot of this has to do with the idea of tolerance, but at the end we're going to see that this is a, a glimpse of what it means for us to um, have the ticket, the entrance ticket. This was a church where tolerance existed, where lines between truth and error were blurred. And I just want to make a side note on this one. Um, when I'm thinking about tolerance, I'm thinking about this and how the way our culture today uses it, not how the word is historically been used or meant. Tolerance as a virtue was closer to the idea of long-suffering, endurance, putting up with. A couple weeks ago when I was writing this, I was going through this phase where I forgot, kept forgetting to turn off the iron after I got done ironing a shirt. And I'd get a text or a call, and this is not how that call would go. Hey honey, I just wanted to let you know the iron was left on. But don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. Doesn't matter if the house burns down, you freely expressed yourself by forgetting to turn the iron off. It was tolerated because I wasn't strangled. That's how I know that Carrie tolerated it. It was, you, you forgot to turn the iron off. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. It, it's okay, we just don't wanna burn the house down. That's how the conversation went. That's called tolerance. Tolerance is the thing that parents do when they're exhausted and they look at each other and go, do you just wanna to survive tonight? Yes, we'll go get McDonald's. We don't, you don't get McDonald's because it's delicious and nutritious, or even that it's real food. You do it because you're exhausted and you know, especially those of you that had children, you go, oh, I remember those days, and you just get by. You buy yourself a night so you can meal plan later. That's what we're thinking about when we think about tolerance. But the way tolerance is used as a virtue now is that it is the unescapable virtue of progressive secularism, where tolerance is not just putting up with, tolerance is giving active assent, condoning, or endorsing, so that the only thing intolerable is not tolerating something. Doesn't matter if it's true, healthy, good, or right, it is to be tolerated and not just put up with, but endorsed. And so that's what we're gonna look at with the church at Pergamum. The church at Pergamum is a distinction from the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was a church that knew and did, but they didn't have love. And that's where we got into that whole first one about the loveless orthodoxy. But the church at Pergamum was one that had love and doing without truth. Pergamum allowed for error to be taught and lived within the church, and Pergamum de-emphasized a doctrinal clarity or certainty. So that's why it's important for us, and that's why our big idea this morning is that the validity of our salvation is confirmed in our theology and in our lives. And that's what we see from the church at Pergamum is this confirmation, the validity, this sealing, this affirming of our salvation in what we believe and in what we do. And it's with that that I want us to read Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church at Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, 
with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word that speaks through the ages to us, that gives us a picture of what we as your church are to be. We are to hold fast to what is true. We are to cling to what is good. We are to have clarity in what we believe, and that that with our actions shows our salvation, shows and confirms our transformation. So as we read these passages this morning, I pray that our hearts would be pricked, that we would be brought closer to you, and as a church that we would be distinct, that we would be called out for Jesus' glory. Amen. Mm -hmm. I do want us to look at three things from this, um, three principles to draw out. The first one is that Theology, what we know about God, and that's just a big word for truth about God, words about God, is rooted in certain truth. There is a, a standard and a, and a bedrock that we can plant, that we can find out what is true, and then build what we know about God off of that. Um, the central confession is the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. That goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 6. The, the Jews will call that the Shema. And it's this confession that God is, this is, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is not anyone else. And it's a, it's a, two, sent, it's a two phrase sentence, but it's so profound and, and full. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is one God, and we have sworn our allegiance to him. You can't have competing, you can't have multiple. This is a God that they have they, that the Israelites pledged themselves to, <laughs> confessed, swore to, followed, obeyed, yielded their lives to, worshipped, gloried in. And there's only one. And that's a bedrock that we can dig down deep on. <laughs> Scholars agree that, that Pergamum was a center of pagan worship, um, the imperial cult, in a real sense of not God. Happening. That's why Jesus doesn't talk about this like we would talk about Orlando. Like when we talk about Orlando, we'll talk about, oh my gosh, this is like if Vegas and Mickey Mouse got together and created this whole city built on this constant cycle of entertainment. That's not what we're talking about here. This isn't something where you escape from reality and live in this kind of magical dream world. Jesus says this is where Satan lives. And so we have to remember that when he says that, he means it. That this is a place where the worship of God was not necessarily welcome. There's temples to Zeus. It was a heart of the imperial cult, um, which is the, the, the worship of the emperor. Andrew Knowles in the Bible Guide Commentary says that Pergamum was a seat of Roman authority with Caesar as its god. And, that's, and so because of that, it bears the sword. So when they say... Christian yield to Caesar, and they say no, the government has a sword that then they use to strike down the Christian. But Jesus bears a stronger sword, a two-edged sword, not a single edge, two-edged, sharper than anything else, that is more powerful than anything that Rome can wield. The early church's confession, if we were to look at perhaps the, the, the Jewish confession of the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, as a separation, distinction from the pantheon of gods. And we think about, you know, especially with Egypt, that's the context that that was spoken in, um, in contrast to the Egyptian gods. The Christian's confession was simpler. In Greek, it's two words. In English, it's three. Jesus is Lord. That was their confession. And that was more than just, just like how the, the Jewish confession of the Shema was more than just a statement, a proposition of truth. The Christian confession of Jesus as Lord was more than just a, an, an allegiance or a statement or a, uh, an, an expression of worship. It was deeper than that because it was borrowed or we might even say copied from the Roman confession of Caesar is Lord. And so the Christians were not just declaring their worship, they were declaring their allegiance, their alliance, their devotion was not to Caesar, but to a greater king, King Jesus. And that's what would keep getting them in trouble. 
is that they would keep this confession of Christ is Lord, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Because there's multiple Caesars, but there's one God. This persecution was largely tied to that. If they wouldn't embrace the imperial cult. Like Nathaniel said to the kids, we don't know much about an an Antipas or Antipas. I don't know how you pronounce it. How you would say it, Antipas is probably the closest. But whoever it was, this was a faithful witness who died for his faith. And we know a little bit about what was happening in Pergamum, that a lot of it was tied to the imperial cult, but we don't know much beyond that. Church tradition holds that Antipas, because he would not yield to the Roman authority, to the Roman system of worship, was placed in what they call the brazen bull, um, which is a metal bowl that you would put someone in and then you light a fire underneath of it. And you would be roasted alive and your cries and your screams would come out the nostrils of the bull like it was a bull making noise. And it was done not just for execution, but also for spectacle. And so we, what we do know about Antipas is whatever he did, however he stood for Christ, it cost him his life in a pretty horrendous way. And then also in church tradition, um, Antipas is remembered as the patron saint of people with toothaches. Just like you die a martyr's death and you're the patron saint of toothaches. It's kind of sad, isn't it? It's kind of sad. Truth is everlasting, but error keeps getting recycled. And that's what we have here with this idea of, of, of our, our doctrine, our truth, our theology, what we know about God to be rooted in certain truth. It is fixed. It is constant. It is, is eternal. What we believe about God has, has not changed. Um, in fact, there's, there's a thread, of, a purple thread from the apostles to today of orthodoxy. That if we were to go to an ancient church, we were to go to a first century church, their doctrine, what they believed about God, Jesus, um, the Holy Spirit, salvation, scripture, would be virtually unchanged. It's been nuanced a little bit because we've been able to develop, we've been able to figure out and translate. Um, we're not reading Greek, we're reading English, so we've been able to kind of expand our understanding of what God had said. But if we get down to brass tacks, there's really not a lot of dissimilarity between us and Christians who have lived for 2,000 years. And that's an amazing thing when you think about it. That what has happened since is there's been splinters and, and, and offshoots over what we would call secondary issues. That's why we don't have a little tiny baptistry for Jed. We're going to wait till he gets older and we'll baptize him up there because we believe that's a big deal. Our Presbyterian friends would go the other way. doesn't mean that they're not Christians. It just means that we probably couldn't plan a church with them because we disagree on how big the baptistry ought to be. Um, truth is everlasting. Jesus contrasts old and new to remind us that there's really nothing new under the sun when it comes to heresy. It's just a denial of what God said. And it's really easy to get clever with it, but most of the time it just gets recycled. Jesus uses the Old Testament example of, of Balaam and the new example of the Nicolaitans. And both of them were doing the same thing. They both said the same thing. Eat meat sacrificed to idols and it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So participate in pagan worship and do whatever you want with your body because it's the spirit that matters. And that's Gnostic. That's what we would say is heretical. It does matter what we do with our bodies. Our bodies are a temple. It does matter what we do for worship. And so that's just, it's getting recycled. The Arians from the third and fourth century are recycled today as Jehovah's Witnesses. The Judaizers of the first century who said you had to obey kosher and do all the Jewish laws and follow all of that, it's recycled today as Seventh-day Adventists. The, Ari the modalists who thought that God only existed at one time in one form, it's just being recycled as T.D. Jakes. Heresy recycles itself. It's, it tries to be clever, but it can't duplicate itself. It's not original. It all goes back to Genesis 3, has God really said. It just keeps coming up with new inventive ways to do the same old thing. If you think about it, that's what your vacuum cleaner does. You can buy the biggest, fanciest, most important vacuum cleaner. You could drop a thousand bucks on a vacuum cleaner. But what's it going to do that the $50 vacuum cleaner does? It's still going to suck up stuff. That's all heresy is. New heresy is just, an, is just an improvement on the old heresy. 
But our lives are then marked by steadfast obedience. So not only does it matter what we do, what we believe, but what we do with what we believe. For the church at Ephesus, it mattered because they believed the right things and they did the right things. What was missing was the motivation. What was missing was the fuel behind it. They did the right things because they loved truth more than they loved their neighbor. For the church at, at Pergamum, they loved their neighbor more than they loved truth. And they did the right things. They stood firm during tribulation. They stood firm during persecution, but they missed the point. What, we, what matters isn't just what we believe, but what we do with what we believe. Pergamum was the church that did and loved but didn't know. Ephesus was the church that did and knew but didn't love. Pergamum stood firm during its trial, refused to bend the knee. So from outside threats, they stood firm. They withstood the trials of temptation. They lived and worked and met and worshipped where Jesus said, Satan takes up residence. That's really hard for us to comprehend. How that close to this hotbed of pagan worship of Satan dwelling, that this church remains faithful under fire. They did. They held firm. They held ground. Antipas dies, and they don't give up. They press on. But it was from within that they missed the point. They did really good with the external threats, but what they didn't do was guard the purity of the church inside. The internal was what was missing. If you think about it, this is like a, um, you know, if we were to it, it put the fanciest security system on our house where like a fly lands on the front door, it's zapped by a laser, mm -hmm. but then the robber is the guy that we invite in. That's what's going on here. They had all the external defenses, but, one, but then inside was the problem, and the robber was someone that they led in the house. The core of, of Balaam and Nicolaitan theology was that body and flesh were insignificant and we could do whatever we wanted. And Jesus is saying that this is counter to what Christians ought to believe and to do. And whatever it is, we don't quite know the extent, but we can assume and we can deduce from the fact that this is something that the church obviously endorses, is that these were views that were either not countered or were taught, or in some other way kind of promoted, endorsed by the church. That it was a church where if you, as long as you were okay on a few things, you could do whatever you wanted with your body. And, and Jesus is saying, like, actually, that's not it. And in fact, this is nothing new. This is old Balaam stuff. This is, old, this is new Nicolaitan stuff. This is all the same thing. You're just calling it something different. Um, how many flu viruses do you have to have in your body to have the flu? One. Doesn't take much. Because it spreads from within. Um, there's some kind of formal endorsement. They have let the corruption in. You have one cold virus. You have one flu virus. You got the flu. You got a cold. Because it spreads from within. So the idea here is that this false teaching had been let into the church and then grew and it was going to eventually infect and infest. And in fact, if we look through church history, this is usually what happens when churches abandon um, central tenets of Christianity, is it doesn't happen because there's outside pressure. It happens because false views, inaccurate views of primary importance. I always have to make that distinction between primary and secondary. It goes back to that idea of tolerance, okay? Guys, does your wife love that you leave your socks on the floor? No. Does she tolerate it? Yeah. Guys, do you love the cooking show or the home decorating show that your wife watches? Guys, maybe you're into those too. Um, that's okay. We, I, we are. We're fascinated by them. Do you, do you fully get behind it or do you put up with it? Put up with it. Some of it's because you put up with it because you, in the back of your head you go, oh no, she's going to get ideas. <laughs> or, you know, guys, we do this to our wives. Like, we'll watch something and then they think, oh no, he's getting ideas. That's, that's called tolerance. We tolerate secondary issues. Style of dress, Bible translation used, temporary versus traditional, King James versus NIV, 
Um, some of these other things, uh, what do you, or is it okay to mow your lawn on a Sunday? Those would all be things that we would consider secondary issues that it's okay for us to differ on. It's fine. Those are matters of preference and conscience. And I just finished a great book on the role of conscience in the believer's life. Be happy to loan it out. It's got my doodle notes in it. Feel free to try to translate those. God bless poor Susie, because she'll send me something and I'll handwrite it. And next thing I know, I get a phone call. What is the third word? I cannot figure that one out. <laughs> the primary stuff matters. And this is where the primary stuff is important. What we believe about the scripture, what we believe about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, salvation, those things matter. And in those, we need to have unity. Amen. We need to have unity on that. Um, the steadfastness that this church had was that those things that were essential were put away and made optional. Brakes are not optional on your car. Surprisingly, in some places, air conditioning still is. I can't fathom that. Heated seats are here. Like I, Dad, when we were in Louisville, my dad has heated seats in his car, and I remember like we had to we borrowed his car to go somewhere because it had heated seats, and I was like, Dad, can we take your car? It has heated seats, and he's like, What? Is 30 degrees too cold for you? Yes. As a matter of fact, it is. We did, heated seats in Florida are very optional. Air conditioning is not. Amen. Have I beat that dead horse into the ground? All right, great. The issue is how we deal with this is we do it through loving, corrective restoration. How we handle this idea of, of primary issues that become optional or are promoted within the church. It's loving, corrective restoration. I want to work backwards on that one. Restoration is the goal. I have had people say really dumb things, in, and I have said really dumb things. Heretical things. I am so thankful that no recordings exist of the first few times I taught Sunday school. I am so grateful for those because there's probably things that I would fire me over that I said. And I've had people say really dumb things. I've had people recommend really dumb books. And I'll never forget one that someone handed to me and the words that came out of their mouth were, you should read this. I've never thought about God this way before. And I looked at him and went, there's a reason why. It's wrong. That's why you've never thought of God like that. It, the, the reality is, is that we're all going to. And when it happens, the goal is restoration. We don't burn heretics anymore. We don't put them on a stake. We don't parade them and throw rotten food at them. But where there is false teaching, it does need to be corrected. And the goal is restoration, not punitive. That's right. I, some, I, had a, I had someone tell me one time that, that um, about natural creation and that uh, we could tell so much about God just from looking around. And I was like, well, yeah, we can, but that's incomplete. <laughs> oh, it is? And I didn't just immediately look at him and go, die heretic. Like... Go worship nature, you tree hugger. The issue was that it, it was someone who needed to be corrected, and it was a restoration, because there's no such thing in Christianity as a lost cause. I think that's the thing we always have to remember, is that no one is a lost cause. If anyone was, it would be you, and God would have given up on you a long time ago. But because God didn't give up on you, then God doesn't give up on the person that you think is wrong on something that's a big deal. So there is a restoration that is the goal. Corrective is the process. Look at verse 17, okay? Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God has spoken clearly to us. It has been preserved in Scripture. Is there room for interpretation? Sure, on, on, on secondary issues. But you can't read the Bible and go, wow, God, God didn't create anything. Wow, Jesus is the other way to Jesus is one of many ways to salvation. We can't do that. God has spoken definitively on these primary issues in the Word. That is the voice of the Spirit speaking to us. The voice of God is recorded in Scripture. I'll never forget, I heard someone that said, if you want to hear God speak out loud, just read the Bible out loud. You don't have to worry about listening to God speak. You can just read your Bible out loud. What the Spirit says to the churches. God has given us a word. That is the process. Everything is, is 
aligned and filtered through Scripture. Luther, when he was asked to recant his writings, said, unless I can be convinced by Scripture, show me from Scripture where I was wrong. Show me from Scripture where it is mistaken. And Scripture becomes the boundary lines for what we determine is true or false. What God has spoken we can be certain of, and that becomes kind of the process. So we look at the Bible. We don't look at what someone said. We don't look necessarily at even what a theologian had to say. There's plenty of theologians that are dead wrong. The leading New Testament scholar in America right now is an agnostic. Even really smart people can get the Bible wrong. So what we do is we look at what the Bible has to say. But loving is, all, loving is the attitude. Every first-year seminary student thinks church discipline is the greatest thing ever. That anyone who is out of line, you can whack and ex excommunicate. Anyone who's ever been through a church discipline process knows that it is one of the most painful things you can ever go through. Because so many times it's used as a club and restoration isn't the goal, and always there's hurt. That's why I was so glad when um, doing the Tuesday men's study that when we were going through the life of Christ, I got through Matthew 17, and then I got to hand 18 to Ron and go, church discipline's on you, buddy. Have fun with them. <laughs> Welcome back. How's your gallbladder? <laughs> because it, the, the sentiment of love is what's behind all of this. Yes, we get frustrated with our kids. Yes, we want to correct the behavior. But more than anything, what overrides that is an attitude of love. And in short, we do what God has said in the word for the good of the body, the joy of our souls, and the blessing of our neighbors. That's why truth matters. It's for the good of the body, the joy of our souls, and the blessing of our neighbors. Truth matters. For the good of, our, for the, good of the body the joy of our souls, the blessings of our neighbors. Truth isn't something that we can just go, eh, they tried. Like these Super Bowl tickets, eh, close enough, let them in. It doesn't work like that. Because that's not good for the body or the soul or for our neighbors. The last thing, the Spirit himself is our guarantee. Uh, whenever Sam leaves basketball practice, we we'll always tell him, finish on a make. Miss 10 shots in a row, but finish on a make. So let's finish on a make. Let's take a look at a good note. Let's reread verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, God is talking to the churches. Those who will listen, God has a word for them. To the one who conquers, to the one who finishes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The Spirit is our guarantee. If you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, it is a guarantee that you have been transformed by God. If you have the Spirit dwelling in you, convicting you of sin, guiding you, opening your eyes to the Word, showing you, directing you, your path, means you're in the, in the family. It means that he is your guarantee. The Spirit speaks to the church. And for this church at Pergamon, going through intense persecution, there is a promise of a hidden manna and a white stone. Don't want to get too bogged down into the specifics, but the, the hidden manna is obviously, for all of us who have read the Old Testament, a reminder of God's provision of the manna. That God gave bread that sustained his people day after day after day after day. And what does Jesus call himself? The bread of life. You eat him, you'll never be hungry again. See, the thing with the manna was, every day they had to go get more. And every day their stomachs would rumble. And they'd have to go get more manna. With Jesus, everything is fully satisfied. Your souls, your hearts, your longing, your minds, everything is satisfied. There's no need for more because you've been given all you need. Also, the white stone. I didn't know this until I was reading it. That was an admission ticket. And so you think about it. 
Those were used as tokens to get in or to, to receive something, and it would bear the mark of whoever it was that gave it out. For Super Bowl tickets, it comes from the NFL. It's got the NFL logo, it's got the NFL barcode, it's got NFL holograms, it's got all of that right there. You go to a Rays game, it's got the sign of the Tampa Bay Rays. Who knows, it could be the Montreal Rays next year. We don't, not for certain. You go to a concert, and it says the name of the band, and it has the barcode. And so when they scan it, they know it is a valid ticket to get you in wherever it is that you're going. You go to the movie theater, they scan, make sure you are in the right place for the right show at the right time. And it gets you in. So Jesus is telling this church, while they're going through persecution, while they're watching their friends suffer and die, not you know, clean up the inside. That's the that's the warning. That's the repent. And if they don't, Jesus will deal with them. He'll come with the sharp two-edged sword. And if you think Rome can be harsh, wait till you see what God can be like. That's the warning. That's always what happens in these in these churches in Revelation. There's a warning, but the finish, the make, is Jesus hasn't left you, and in Christ you have a valid ticket, not to the Colosseum. Not to the gladiator games, not to the market, but to heaven. And the Spirit is the one who guarantees the ticket. That's better than any kind of Super Bowl that you could go to. It's better than any Final Four, or concert, or anything like that. Christ, uh, Christian, in Jesus, you have been sealed by the Spirit. You have been sealed. And you cannot erase it. You can't out grace. You can't out God's devotion to you because God has sealed you. You may run, but you will come home because the prodigal son comes home. God's given himself as our guarantee, our security, and our hope. And so when you go through hardship, you have hope that the Spirit is the one who stands with you and the Spirit is the one who guarantees that says, don't worry, you're in. Nothing to, nothing to fear. No matter how many precautions we take, we can still get played. And that's what happens. That's why counterfeit bills are so hard to spot sometimes. We can do everything we can. We can put all these security measures in place and we can still get played. The NFL can do any of these security measures and there's still going to be people who have realistic looking tickets that are still going to get played next Sunday in Miami. But for the believer... God himself keeps us from being played. Amen. God is the one who secures. So believer, take comfort. Whatever you're going through, the Spirit, God himself, bears witness that you are his. And there's nothing that they can do or that you can do to lose that. Take comfort in that this morning. That the book of Revelation is a word to Christians going through hardship and struggle. That there's a stone that you have that says they're in. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Some of you are sitting here going, uh, I hope this is good. As the Bible tells us that we can be confident, secure, sure. Um, that's the whole message of 1 John that we'll do later this year, is that we can know for certain that we are in him. And so if there is any doubt, any question, any uncertainty, if you were asked the question, do you know for sure if you die today that you go to heaven, then don't leave here without getting that straight, getting that right. For some of you, you're sitting here and you're asking, how can God possibly love me because I have dot, dot, dot. If that's you, don't leave here without talking to someone and getting that straight. Because Christian, God has sealed you with the Spirit. And God has given you a church that can surround you, encourage you, love you, and speak truth into you to help you deal with that. We're going to stand in just a minute. We're going to sing. And we're going to sing, I am thine. And this is more than just a, a song that we're going to sing. This is a confession. Just like how the, how the Old Testament confession was the Shema and the New Testament confession was Jesus as Lord, this is one for us that we can add to that. It says, I am yours. I am thine, O Lord. And, and that's, that's a, a statement that's profound because it says, I'm giving up control and I'm letting you take the wheel.
I'm letting you have control. I'm letting you be the Lord of my life. I'm surrendering to you. And wherever you lead, I'll go. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the word. To know that in heaven there is a book with our names in it that can never be erased. That can never be ripped out or torn or removed. That it's a book written in blood written in the blood of Jesus who has sealed us, who has saved us, and who has made us his own. And there is nothing that can take that away. Father, I pray for the ones who need comfort from that this morning, that you would do so, that you would give them assurance of their ticket, of their salvation, their hope that has been secured by Christ. For those who don't have that security, Lord, I pray that you would give them that, that you would, by your Spirit, give the gift of faith, that they can know you, that they can trust you, or give them a gift of assurance, of confidence that comes. Your Word tells us that you didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love, self-control. We don't have to be afraid if we know we're yours. Father, we ask that you would work in these moments. Spirit, we pray that you would fill this place and that as we confess that we are yours, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd lead us, that you'd take us wherever it is that you want us to go, and that we would follow you because we know how good you are. We know your love, and we cling to that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stand and sing.